Hello grade 11s and grade 12s and welcome back to my channel. I'm Miss Martins. In today's video we're going to be looking at Newton's first law of motion. We'll be looking at the definition, important theory that you need to know, and we'll be doing a basic calculation. But watch the whole video because I will be giving teacher tips throughout the video and at the end of the video. Remember I set metric papers, I mark up at a metric level, so I know what they're looking for and what they test in the exams. Let's jump right in. Firstly, in order to tackle a Newton's first law question, you need to make sure that the question is a Newton's first law question. Now behind me, I've summarized my best teacher tips to help you recognize if it's a first law question or a second law question. Let's focus on the first law. So if the question says the object is moving at a constant or uniform velocity or speed, if they say the object is stationary or still or not moving, if they say the object is in equilibrium, then you know you're dealing with a Newton's first law question. And you can start off your question by saying F net equals MA, but because acceleration is zero, F net is equal to zero. So F net is equal to zero is how we basically start off our Newton's first law calculations. If you've missed the video where I go through how to use your free body diagram to help you set up force equations, you may want to check that out because that's going to be very helpful for both Newton's first law and second law. I'll link that in the description box below, but it's very important to first make sure you are doing the correct type of question. But hold up, before we get to a calculation, what is Newton's first law of motion? So you can see the definition at the top of the screen behind me. So it says Newton's first law of motion, a body will remain in its state of rest or motion at a constant velocity unless a non-zero resultant or net force acts on it. So you can see in the definition that they mention both a state of rest, so staying stationary or still, or motion at a constant velocity. So constant speed, constant velocity, uniform velocity. So they say if those are the cases, then we are dealing with Newton's first law of motion. And a body will stay in the state of motion or state of rest unless a non-zero resultant or net force acts on it. Now, what does this mean? If you take a look at these pictures behind me, the first picture says, Newton's first law states that an object will remain at rest. So you can see that that cone over there in this picture the block is not moving, so that block will stay still. Until when will that block stay still? And you could say, well, ma'am, someone could come and push it over and then it'll move. And you are right. It will move in that scenario because a non-zero net force or resultant force is acting on it, a pushing force, which is a net force, a non-zero net force. And in the same way, we can see this picture over here, so it says an object moving at a constant velocity will continue moving at that same velocity or speed. So if the, vo uh, the basketball is in motion, it will stay in motion. And technically, if the surface is frictionless, it'll stay in motion forever. So if I kick a ball on a truly frictionless surface, it'll carry on like that forever, according to Newton's first law. In this sequence of diagrams, it doesn't continue forever. Why? Because look at the ball, it hits the cone. And what happens is a non-zero net force is acting on the ball, which is causing the ball either to stop, slow down, change direction. In other words, causing the ball to accelerate. Okay, so that is Newton's first law. An object or a body will remain in its state of motion or rest at a, at a constant velocity if it's in that motion unless a non-zero resultant or net force acts on it. Now, teacher tip. I set metric papers, I mark them, so I know that if you don't say non-zero, they take away a mark. If you don't say resultant or net, you can choose. They take away a mark. You need to say these things in order for you to get your full marks for your definition. So here's a repetition of the definition for you. This definition comes from your exam guidelines. So this is the correct definition. You will see alternative definitions on the internet, in weird textbooks, weird videos on the internet, but this is the correct definition according to your exam guidelines. Okay, cool. F net equals MA. Remember, we technically should start all Newton's law questions like this. Newton's first and second law. But remember, I did tell you that F net equals zero if we're dealing with the Newton's first law question. And the reason why F net equals zero ultimately is because acceleration is zero. Because remember, the object is either not moving, which means acceleration is zero, or it's moving at a constant velocity, which means acceleration is zero. So the body's in equilibrium, there's zero net force acting on it. 
Now, before I go into a calculation, there is something very important that you need to know. According to exam guidelines, you do need to know safety considerations in terms of Newton's first law of motion. So you could be like, ma'am, what are you talking about? You need to understand why it is important for us to wear seat belts when traveling in a car. Now, think about this. You're sitting in a car. You do not have your seatbelt on. Okay, you're sitting in a car, the car is going at 120 kilometers per hour. That's very fast, very, very fast. You, because you're in the car, you are traveling at the same constant velocity, 120 kilometers an hour. Now, what happens if the car breaks? What happens? So think about it. If the car breaks, okay, it's negative acceleration. The car is slowing down. It's changing its velocity. However, the passengers, so in this case, me, I'm pretending to be a passenger in a car, because I have something called inertia, because I have mass, that means that I do want, I want to resist any change in motion. So because I have mass, I have inertia, which is just a property of a body, it resists change in motion. So because I'm traveling at 120 kilometers per hour, I want to continue traveling at 120 kilometers per hour. This is also according to Newton's first law. Newton's first law says I'm at motion at 120 kilometers an hour, constant velocity. My body wants to continue traveling at the same constant speed. So when the car breaks, I will continue to move at the same velocity that the car was moving at before the brakes were applied. And I will fall forward. I will fly forward. It's not a good thing for me. What does wearing a seatbelt help with? Well, the seatbelt provides the non-zero resultant force. And it's a backwards force. So think about if you've ever been in a car and you've been wearing a seatbelt and the car suddenly comes to a stop, that seatbelt pulls you back quite sharply against your seat. So the seatbelt provides a resultant, a non-zero resultant or net force. And it basically ensures that my velocity changes in the same way of the car. So when the car slows down, I slow down. So you need to be able to use Newton's first law, apply Newton's first law to explain these various scenarios. So for example, if a pencil lies on a desk board or a dashboard of a car that is in motion, will the pencil remain stationary when the car breaks? Unless there's something holding on to the pencil, the, pe the pencil won't remain stationary. It will want to continue at the same constant velocity according to Newton's first law. So it'll stay in that state of motion at that same velocity. So when the car velocity decreases. The pencil's velocity won't. It'll continue at the same velocity and it'll fall off the dashboard or roll off the dashboard. And you can use that same argument for all of these scenarios over here. Okay, now that we know the theory, let's jump into a Newton's first law calculation. So this is an example of a Newton's first law question. We've got a body, so a box or whatever, or a person or whatever, of mass 100 kilograms, let's say it's a box, rests on a horizontal surface. So they don't give me a picture, I'm just going to draw you a picture. Here's my box, it's 100 kilograms, it's resting on the surface, and they give me the coefficient of kinetic friction, so that is this little symbol over here, is 0 0.2, my mass is 100 kilograms, and look what the question wants. Calculate the force required to slide the body at a constant velocity. Now, the reason we know it's a Newton's first law question is because of the wording constant velocity. That means that acceleration is zero. And therefore, remember, F net is equal to MA. But if A is zero, F net is zero. And we know it's a Newton's first law question. Now, I find questions like this very, very difficult to do, especially as they get more complicated, unless I have a free body diagram. They didn't ask me to draw one, but I'm going to draw one because it helps me so much with my question. So a box resting on a flat horizontal surface, or it sits on a flat horizontal surface. We know we're going to have normal force acting straight up. That's Fn because there's a surface involved. We know we have Fg acting straight down. They say they want me to calculate the force required to slide the body at a constant velocity. So obviously we're going to have an applied force acting in one direction. So let's pretend it's going to the right. That's F applied. That's the force required to slide the box. I'm going to highlight that just so we can see that is what I'm actually looking for. Calculate the force required to slide the body. I'm looking for F applied. Cool. Now they do say that there's a coefficient of kinetic friction. 
which means that there's obviously friction present. And if the box moves to the right, friction goes to the left and is parallel to the surface. So I'm going to say FK for kinetic friction. Now, you have to always assume that there's friction present unless they say frictionless. That's an important teacher tip because some people see that there isn't a mention of friction in the question. So even if they didn't say the coefficient of kinetic friction, so even if they didn't tell me that there was a coefficient of kinetic friction, we have to assume that there's kinetic friction unless they say that the surface frictionless. Remember, if you don't understand any of these individual forces, I have videos on all the individual forces, also how to draw free body diagrams, so that's linked down below. But drawing it is very important because it helps me understand and answer the question, I think at least. So again, we know it's a first law question, so we know F net is equal to zero. So I'm going to write F net is equal to zero. They want us to calculate the force required to slide the body or to move the body to the right at a constant velocity. So I'm looking for F applied. Now, in my one video where I mentioned the equations for Newton's laws, and I said, you must watch this in order to understand Newton's laws. I said that if we're looking for F applied or if we're looking for any force in the horizontal direction, so the parallel direction or the X direction. So in this case, I'm looking for F applied, which is in that direction. I need to consider all the forces in that direction, which would be both of these forces, F applied plus FK, both of those forces I need to consider. And you might say, why ma'am? Because remember the box is sliding in the horizontal direction. So the two forces that affect that motion would be F applied and FK. That's why I need to consider both of them. I need to add them together. When I add them together, it must give me zero. Why? Because the box is sliding. So the sum of these forces, adding them together, must give me zero. Why zero? Because it's a Newton's first law question. Acceleration is zero, so F net is zero. And my students ask me, ma'am, must I put a plus in between? Because if applied and friction are going in opposite directions, you always start off your equation with vector addition, which means you always start off with putting a plus sign in between. When we substitute in values, that's when we'll put in a minus if necessary. And in this case, it is necessary because I'm going to choose to the right as my positive direction. So I'm looking for F applied. F applied will be going to the right. That's my positive direction. So when I substitute in a value for friction, I will substitute that in as a negative. But first I have to find friction. How do you find friction? Friction, kinetic friction, is equal to the coefficients of kinetic friction multiplied by the normal force. Now, yes, they do give me the coefficient of kinetic friction. They give me that. That is 0, 0,2. But do they give me the normal force? No, they don't. However, I can find the normal force. Look at the normal force here. The normal force is in the same direction as Fg. There are no other forces acting perpendicularly or up or down. So what that means is if I take those two forces, Fn and Fg, and I add those two together, it must also give me zero, which actually technically means that Fn and Fg have the same magnitude. Think about it like this. The box is moving in this direction, not this direction. So Fn and Fg, those are the only two forces acting in the perpendicular direction. The box does not move in the perpendicular direction. So it moves in the horizontal direction and it moves at a constant velocity, which means in the horizontal direction, F net is zero because it's moving at a constant velocity. But it's not moving at all in the perpendicular direction. Think about it. The box is going like this. It's not moving in the up-down direction, which, which means that F net in the up-down direction is also equal to zero. So technically, the correct way to write that in order to find the normal force is as follows. We technically should do the following. I'm going to use the two blue forces, Fn plus Fg must give me zero. Now, let's say up is positive, Fn Fg is going down. Do you see how it's pointing downwards? So I'm going to say minus. How do you work out Fg? In the previous videos, we discussed that it's mass, so 100, times gravitational acceleration, 9.8. That must equal zero. So take it over. Fn equals 
then it becomes a positive 100 times 9.8 and it would will be 980 newtons upwards and i know what you're thinking i know what you're thinking grade 11s and grade 12s ma'am that equation is so unnecessary because the box is on a flat surface so that means that if g which is 100 times 9.8, is the same as the normal force. So why can't I just say 100 times 9.8, get the answer, and that's my normal force? You can, that is true. But remember, this is a simple example. You may get an example where if N and if G are not the only two forces acting up or down, and then you have to do it like this. So I want you to practice doing it like this so that when the more difficult examples come, you know what to do. Okay, because if there's another vertical force acting, like if applied perpendicular or something, you can't say if n is equal to fg because it's not. Okay, so we found the normal force, which is 980 newtons up. And remember, why did I want to find the normal force? Well, because I was looking for fk. Remember, fk, frictional force, is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. So it is 0, 0,2 given in the question, times the normal force, 980. Why do I want friction? Because I need friction in order to work out the applied force. So friction is 196 newtons to the left. So I'm going to say minus 196 here in my formula. Again, why is it minus? Because I chose to the right as positive and friction is going to the left. That means that my applied force required to keep moving the box at a constant velocity is 196 newtons to the right or in the positive direction. So knowing how to do these Newton's laws questions properly is very, very important. Remember, in your exam, we do allocate marks for things such as do you start off with vector addition? And I know in some memos they don't. But when we mark at a final metric level, we do sometimes look for that. You need to start with vector addition. You need to choose your positive direction, then substitute your, your answer in. You need to be able to use a free body diagram to work out these little equations that you need in order to do Newton's laws. So I hope that this example was helpful. I will be doing a lot more if I have not already. So this is a living and breathing playlist, which means that I am adding to it all the time. So I have past paper videos. I have videos going over examples. So remember to click the link in the description box below. I also have this that I'm busy working on if it's not out already. My website is linked in the description box below as well for more information on that. So hopefully all of these things will help improve your physical sciences marks. And I can't wait to see you guys in another video where we tackle either Newton's second law or more difficult Newton's first law questions, whichever video you end up watching first. I love all of you. Thank you for your support and I'll see you in more videos. Bye everyone.